Hello? Hi, how are you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we went, we had a, uh, well, we went to some people for dinner last night, so uh, I'm going to see if I can look together some slides here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So just ignore me for a little while. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're going to start with a couple of other things. So. <laughs> Looking for an old lecture that might have appropriate. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Love an A. How are you? Okay. Yes, I found a lecture. I can re-give. Okay. It's actually old either from 2015. <laughs> Good. That was exactly what I'd want to say, pretty much. Yep. All right. All right. So I think it's three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, this does it. Okay, I yeah, got it. All right, that's good. How many slides is it? Yeah, yeah it's only 66 slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but actually it does it. Okay, so uh, whatever you want to do with it, there I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> here, that, uh, let's see, where are we here? Let's see, let's share. I do a present now. This Uh, select window or screen. Yeah. Okay. Screen window or screen to share. Select window or screen. Hello, Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? Oh, it's an echo. <laughs> are you ready? Do you have your uh, talk ready today, Joao? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, this one. Okay. 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 What do you see? I see your slides. You have a bunch of slides here. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. You see one on. You see the first slide on the screen. Yeah, I see it on the screen. Unusual. Okay. Okay. So I want to make sure you selected the right window. Yeah. I've got two sides. 
Two, two sides. sides. Two sides. Just tells you one, two, or three. I don't know which is one, two, or three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll stop presenting. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, we have a couple things on the agenda today. So I wanted to first uh, do Ujwal's deep fovea review. Uh, and then we'll maybe we'll go to Dick's uh, presentation next. And then at the end, I'd like to talk about a paper I sent. Uh, I sent uh, four papers to people. One is the deep fovea paper, or two are, oh, here's Jesse. Two are related to Dick's uh, work that he's going to show today. And then I'm going to talk, Jesse sent me a paper on um, Peter's rule, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. And then we'll, we'll uh, have a little we'll, We'll just kind of go through the paper. I'll put it on my screen share, and we'll go through. Here's Esmet. So we're getting a full house today, I see. Okay. Hello, Esmet and Jesse. So, uh, Ujwa, would you like to start? Yes, sir. Okay. You share your screen. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. So today we are going to review about uh, the latest paper which is there in Oculus conference of Facebook like D-Pobia, Neural Reconstruction of Poviated Rendering and Video Compression Using Learned Statistics of new Natural Video. So first of all, before sharing this, before sharing and learning about this, we will know like what is foveated imaging. So foveated imaging is a digital image processing technique in which the image resolution or amount of detail varies across the image according to one or more fixation points. Fixation points is something like uh, if we are in this paper we are talking mainly about AR and VR for in augmented reality and virtual reality itself. Fixation point is something your eyes are focusing on. Uh, points on which your eyes are particularly focusing and removing the peripheral vision. So these are the fixation points. The fixation point indicates the highest resolution region of the image corresponds to the center of eye setting, the fovea. The location of fixation point may be specified in many ways. For example, when viewing an image on computer monitor, you one may specify the fixation using pointing device like computer monitor. Eye trackers are precisely used for measuring the eye position and movement are also commonly used to determine fixation points in perception experiments. When the display is manipulated with the use of eye tracker, this is known as gate contingent display. Fixation may also be determined automatically using computer alert. So there are several uh, applications of these kind of coveted imaging like these are using image sensing hardware, image compression. So these kind of coveted imaging is known as space radius imaging or as I mentioned, big contingent imaging. So now what's special in this paper is they have stated some state of the art techniques to compress the size of image coveting. Like for image coveting in AI and VR, they need a lot of mm, a lot of computing power. So they have reduced the amount of computing power to around 10 to 14 times uh, for the same purpose, to achieve the same thing. So coming to the presentation. So a brief thing about the result. So d is a new AI powered coveted rendering system for augmented and virtual reality display. It renders the image using an order of magnitude to fewer pixels than the previous system and fully producing a full quality experience that is realistic and gaze centric. As you can see in the GIF which is being displayed, there are only 10% of pixels which, are, which we have got from the 
system and they have successfully retrieved the whole image with natural color. So this is the first spectacle band that is able to generate the natural looking video sequence conditional and very fast input. In test, we phobia can decrease the amount of computer resources needed by rendering by as much as 10 to 14 times while any image difference remains imperceptible to the human eye. So the main focus in this research is like rather than making the whole image um, actually uh, more high more of more high resolution, you have to just focus on the areas where they are eyes are focusing. So you can ignore the peripheral vision so that you can decrease the computing amount for this video record. So to get a glance of how it works, this is the video. So as you can see in this video, the fixation point is a square which is your eye. It is of eye tracker and you can see they are manipulating and making your we make very high resolution size where you are focusing on. So this form a VR set. They are creatures that are nothing. And this is the original video and this is your fixation point. And this is a 10% of all the pixels on the screen. And you are only making your fixation point highly resolution, highly pixelated and you are ignoring all the other parts around it. So this is a quick demo of it. So moving forward to application, like how they have achieved something. So we have to talk about a little background of this, like how these things have started. So foveated and per per perceptual rendering. So delivering high quality content to each location in a head mounted display, which is your VR set or something like that, is computa computationally very expensive. To save the computation, Peripheral compression becomes increasingly important for the both effort and capture video content. However, foveated rendering can produce a formant visual artifacts. Similarly, down sampling the eccentricity introduced in analysis and detail. These phenomena encumber the design and efficient and visually looseless foveated rendering. So, Terminal initial work on the foveated rendering is done in 2012, which addresses these problems of computing three base centered concentric rings at progressively lower resolution. So, this is a little background like how these all things are being used and generated. As you can see in the figure, this is a drop off of equity, green cycles per degree, versus degree eccentricity. It can be introduced by Introduced in 2014, so these are some initial works which are being done in foveated image analysis. So foveated video compression. So video compression standards have been emerged in the incremental incremental changes to the hybrid video encoders. We know many video uh, compressors models like VP9, AV1. These are most popular standards used by the media platform. These standards do not apply directly to the foveated video compression. Attempts at applying various modification to the input signal to exploit these and approaches have been done earlier before. The recent work that applies the convolution neural networks to compression has yielded the wave one, a highly efficient compression method that exploits the non constrained latent space for better compression. So they have actually used the CNN networks, neural networks to see like which part of video can be compressed to make best uh, best user experience for the user. So the paper, this paper is focusing on like, as we know that Facebook and YouTube both offer 360 degree video format. So these are becoming increasingly very popular with the advanced advent of fisheye cameras and uh, virtual headsets. So by exploiting both eyes head tracking, only the viewed portion of the center team needs to be decoded at full resolution. The fully functioning real-time coordinated compression system has potential to impact how 360 degree video formats are evolving. And these are the some stuff which are being discussed and which is in till in research. In the research and progress phase, uh, at the JREC, uh, which is the joint video exploration team at Facebook. 
so coming back to these are some background for how these things are done so leaving manifold of natural images and videos this is a topic like which is like a little advanced but i guess like for simplicity we can see that high quality images and video follow up natural scene statistic a uh, human visual system has adapted to expect these statistics and heavily relies on it when entering to the peripheral detail as a result learning these statistics can enable more powerful perceptual compression method so mm, so just of this natural image and videos manifold is like whenever you are seeing a particular image you most most of the time you ignore your peripheral like what is your peripheral input of your eye so this paper definitely focus on only this one important point for the compression technique like it just want to make sure that whatever you are whatever computation power you are using to mm, pixelate the video it should be only in your focus area it doesn't be on your peripheral vision area because if we all we make them highly pixelated till it is coming as a blur to our eye we can't still see it clearly so these generative adversarial networks can learn complex distribution such as manifold of natural image or videos by combining the generator with a trainable adversarial loss implemented using another network called discriminator so what it is called adversarial loss and all these things i am going to discuss further in further slide so neural construction so this is the like how the neural construction is done so the neural construction of this particular model is based on deep fovea network design recurrent unit so as you can also see in the paper it is clearly described that this part uh, this part which you can see i guess you can see my cursor right now so this part is basically known as your g part so g part is something which we need to focus on so for the reconstruction of network g in our system we you choose unit and put a decoder design to skip connect uh, this is a kind of special kind of encoder decoder as we have described in previous work which is used to compress the uh, video quality which are the one of the initial one of the not initial but one of the major steps uh, which is done around in 2015 to transform an image into a hierarchy and skip connections to allow bypasses of high frequencies and improve the gradient flow during the trip each decoder block does the reverse of encoder encoder block performs special bilinear unsampling so what are these terms like special bilinear unsampling these are not going to be discussed further while a decrease in the feature count of corresponding to the symmetric encoder block the input to the encoder block is upscale output to the previous decoder block concatenated with the output of the corresponding encoder block so the one of the major part of the losses now we are going to discuss so losses as i've said losses as the optimized network generation of network g this one has respect to the weighted term of three losses mainly adversarial loss per per perceptual spatial loss and optical flow loss of the temporal band so what is adversarial loss adversarial loss is modeled by the discriminator network discriminator network is something which we have discussed just a few slides ago in the neural recurrent unit so discriminator so discriminator network the discriminator allows to learn the spatial temporal manifold of natural videos by providing a boundary between distrib distribution of interest and the rest of possible videos discriminator in contrast to generator processes the entire video sequence at once and can therefore reason about space time relation and analyze the spatial temporal dynamic the goal of the discriminator is to classify videos into fake and real so like some whenever we are doing something in video analysis or then we are trying so it is very important to validate our whatever, whatever we are doing we have to validate so it does it must not be like we we have made some videos so and for our own purpose like 
we have to be very specific about what, what are the sample of videos we are choosing. It should be very natural. It doesn't like the, we want something for our purpose, like we want to focus on these two points. So we have taken a focus of the camera and use it so that we can make our results more and more improved. So this is one of the things which is used to check out this discrimination. Next is the spectral normalization. The inherent assumption of GAN design is discriminator should be one left case continuous. So if you don't know about like what is left case continuous term, it is a term which is used to check whether it is a standard to check whether the uh, discriminator loss is being uh, like we have to check on some scale, like how much adversary loss and these things are there. So it is kind of scale for that. So I will put the link for it if, uh, in the chat section. So there are several approaches to ensure this continuity. Uh, recent spectral normalization in the discriminator that bounds the metric spectrum of each layer of phase. This approach allows the fast training, which is crucial for training video, while leading to a comparable result with the state of the art method. So they have used this. Then another important thing in this paper is conceptual spatial law. To promote the similarity of reconstructed frame to its source frame, the measures of similarity is needed. For pixel L1 loss is too low level and perspective. They use a calibrated perspective loss, which they have labeled as LP IPS. By minimizing LP IPS, their network learns to endow each reconstructed frame of the video on the natural image statistic. So, like whatever you are recovering from this 10% of um, whatever you are getting from this 10% of pixels and whatever you are recovering from that image, you have to check somehow like whether it is matching to your original image, the color quality of this image, and many other factors are being included in that. So they make a pixel by pixel matrix and they apply a formula, uh, which I haven't mentioned here, but it is a formula, it's not so complex to check whether the perceptual spatial loss is uh, how to, ch to check that whether the spatial loss and the image which we have recovered is how much it is matching to the original one. So optical flow loss is the, mm, I guess, the loss topic. So the, the optical flow loss is simulate temporal consistency across the frames to disentangle the spatial temporal correlation and video frame. There are multiple ways to employ the optical flow in video generator. One is to estimate the optical flow directly in the generator and require generator to match target optical flow, as well as match the ground truth picture with the RAB image. However, this adds complexity to a network and does not meet the intense performance constraint. So what they have said is like they have there is one way to estimate the optical flow, like whenever you are your fixation point is moving across the image, you have to check that the original quality is being maintained at these spots. But this is in fact a very costly function because to inference that your eyes is moving near and you are focusing there, it is like making whole video again more and more pixelated, which is slightly more computational, uh, which costs slightly more in computation what they have used from what they have. So they have used some kind of indirect approach that encourages a network to retain consistent content and smooth movements over the time, while not prescribing any special content. So now I think we have covered the losses. Now we are going to see how ablation study is being done. So ablation study to validate the design choice made for the network, or have to conduct uh, ablation study to analyze the network capacity gap as well as the contribution of that loss to the final result, they use FWQI metric. It is a metric at which the ablation study is being done. So FWQI detects only the artifacts of spatial reconstruction in a single frame. They, ha they have said that it is not helpful to measure the temporal artifacts in the peripheral region, such as flicker, which is the utmost importance of peripheral reconstruction quality. So, they have divided their ablation study in mainly three parts, network depth, network capacity, and recurrent block. So 
the experiment shows that the network benefits from increasing number of unit blocks. Unit blocks is something that we have covered a uh, little right. Uh, it is coming to 2015. Uh, unit and decoder. and decoder. So these are the unit blocks. The FWQI value first increases sharply from 1 to 3 and then play is from 3 to 5 blocks. Like these are the some statistics which they have provided in their paper to show their network depth. Same with the network capacity, like how much capacity they are using. They have the number of filters follow the pattern doubling every year with the cap of 128 filters. So they provide only number of filters for the first layer. So this is something like how they are in multiplying their network capacity as they are moving per frame. Recurrence blocks. So recurrence blocks are essential for reconstruction of fast input. Recurrent design significantly outperforms the recurrent, non-recurrent one in measure by FQS, FWQI scale. So they demonstrate that this result is uh, they have demonstrated this result in supplementary video, which uh, I will like. I have I don't know like I have that or not. Uh, I think I have not decreed it. I will share it. So this so you can clearly see how the less detail from previous frame and all these things are done. So this is the some comparison which is done between multiple models. So. They have shown a multi-resolution model which is used in foveated imaging, then the deep fovea and the original one. So this is a snapshot from GTA game, then the photo. So they have seen like, this is the fast moving images when you are riding and these are the three different models which they have, two different models and the original one. So as you can see that both multi-resolution and deep fovea has configured for 60 minutes compression. But the gauge at the center of image, the deep program method, which is at the middle end, is able to deconstruct more detail under the same compression rate while causing less flicker and ghosting than the multi resolution. So they have tried to show in this picture like how they have outperformed the original multi resolution system. So they have not commented on the peripheral quality but using program vision, but they have shown that if you are Talking about phobia imaging, they have somehow overcome the multi resolution in some aspects. As you can see, like this, the middle car is more highly detailed from here, and this is a little blurred from here. So, this is something they are trying to show from the image. So, after learning all these things, like they are using, so the question arises is like, why did all these things matter? So high quality AI and VR experience require high image resolution, high frame rate, and multiple view, which can be extremely resource intensive. To advance these systems and bring them wider range of devices, such as those to mobile twisted and small portable batteries, they need to dramatically increase the rendering efficiency. So this model shows how deep learning can help in accomplish this task via coordinated reconstruction. This approach is hardware agnostic, which makes it a promising tool for the potential use in the next generation head mounted display technology. Like in the Facebook, they believe the, in the Facebook, there is a separate division name as Oculus, which totally focuses on AR and VR. Like they believe that this is the technology for next decade. It is going to be very much extensive. They are progressing in the way to make them make this technology more and more affordable. And more and more less compute more and more we can say like to use less computation power so as well as the community explores the way of eye tracking ar vr uh, case technologies like these phobia will be particularly useful the system is one of the several research projects which is introduced into vr vr graphic so it is a part, sub part of deep focus which is the one of the major project which is being run in oculus so this is something now how it is related to biological imaging. So we can see like uh, there is a work being done by one of college alumni, the real world. So in this he is trying to do real time medical visualization using VR set. So this is how he is going to do it. So the one of the major problem which the this startup is facing is that like computation power like if you are making 3d x-rays of the body and you are visualizing it using vr 
So it is computationally extent very expensive, and this whole module is overall very expensive. So I think like deep phobia compression can help in medical imaging, which is going to be uh, going to be done uh, by doctors using VR sets. Like it is very beneficial for to take an image of X-ray and all these things using a VR set. And I think in medical imaging, the deep like these type of compression which are coming can be used extensively to make to make it more and more cheaper and so that many of the health centers and all these can afford it. Uh, obviously, the VR set has advantage over what we can say like uh, in two D and two D X rays and two D images. Like you can view the whole uh, X ray or body in the three dimensional. So it is obviously going to be the technology of maybe next decade so many work is being done on it so i think these kind of technologies can specifically focus on this microscopy and imaging so, so in the, like in the coming meeting i would like to cover the user study case and the methodology while they result like i know that they are time constraints so i have saved this for the next meeting Okay, well, thank you, Ujwal. <clears throat> yeah, you can do that next meeting if you want to, about 20 minutes of, uh, we can discuss some of the other parts of, of this work. I think it's really fascinating. Uh, you were telling me a little bit about the uh, proposal you wanted to write. Um, so I think actually VR would be a good direction to go in, too. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm interested in VR. I've been interested for many years and. I haven't really been able to do any work in it recently, but I think it would be interesting to maybe do some of that for, um, you know, uh, another project where we're trying to create 3D models of, of uh, you know, embryos and other things. And that's been a longstanding interest of mine. So maybe we'll we can talk more about that. Let's go to the chat first uh, before we move on to Dick here. Um, so we had a couple of questions uh, Richard asked, why bother with any compression nowadays? Uh, there was a bit at the end, I think, about like how they needed to uh, keep rendering efficiency very high. And so, you know, you, if you're running this on a mobile device, you know, or a head, head mounted display, you don't have a lot, you don't have infinite memory. Plus, for VR applications, it's important to have no latency. And so if you're looking at something and you're shifting your gaze to different parts of the image, you know, it's, it's good to have like a, uh, a very uh, low memory system so that it doesn't buffer your image. Um, yeah. Uh, Vinay asked, in AR and VR industry, currently we require par powerful hardware which can generate higher resolution images in real time, depending on the user's reactions. This leads to a more immersive experience. So yeah, it's kind of what we were talking about. And I know Facebook bought Oculus, which is a, uh, they, they've developed these VR headsets, which are super high resolution. So uh, it be interesting to see what comes out of that because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a bold choice for a social media company to acquire a VR headset. VR has been, they've been trying to get it commercialized for a long time. And so we'll see if this, if this, what happens. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, as well. That was a very good talk. Um, so now next, uh, when I turn to Dick, he had this question he posed to me uh, uh, via email. I couldn't bring up the email before the meeting, but he said he had a couple of slides he might want to show on his... This was the uh, CT imaging problem that he had mentioned to me. Okay. Uh I've been dropping the line for a few times, so if I disappear for a few seconds, I'll try to come back. Okay. Okay, now uh, let's see. Where's the command for sharing screen? You go to the lower right hand side of the. No more alerts. Present now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do the screen. It's easy. Okay, what's going on here? Screen two, I think. Wow, 
There we go. Okay. Wow. Okay. Now, let me get it. Okay. Can you see this slide? Uh, yes, I can see your screen. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay. It's slides on the side here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go. This is a lecture I gave a few years ago, but it happens to cover the topic. So uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go. I, I started in electron microscopy. Here's, here's the problem in electron microscopy. Uh, we've got a cross section here of a, an object. In this case, it was a ribosome. Uh, and uh, these are different projections that could be taken by tilting it on a tilt stage inside an electron microscope, which is on the vacuum. So you can't get a very wide range of angles. Uh, but you'll notice here, these are taken at consecutive times. And not only are you getting different projections, in other words, the electrons are going across. Can you see my mouse moving or no? Uh, move it across the screen. Yeah, I can see it. You can see it. Okay. Yeah. So these are projections this way. That way it's better. They're, in other words, the electrons are going in different directions across the object. You'll notice that not only are you getting different views, but you're also getting degradation by the electrons of the thing you're looking at. So the electrons are actually destroying the very thing you're trying to image. Okay, so uh, this is a reason for trying to reduce the number of views tre tremendously uh, in the amount of data. Now, this was very old work uh, uh, back in uh, 1969 or so, 70, and uh, this is the way we did 3D reconstructions by stacking sheets of plastic and gluing them together. Uh, our resolution was very limited. Uh, a 50 by 50 image was hard for computers in those days. So this is, uh, this is a typical digital image that I worked with, 50 by 50. Okay? Hardly anything in today's standards. Uh, now, uh, okay, uh, so the, uh, from electron microscopy, we learned you know, radiation is damaging, and so we need to keep the dose as low as possible. Uh, you can do computer tomography from just a few views, uh, and they need not be evenly spaced over the full angle range. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let's see. Okay, what I want to turn to is what I call quantum imaging. And this is... Uh, because you're dealing with electrons in the imaging, and nowadays you can have actually electron counters or single photon counters, uh, the, the question is, can you squeeze out information so you have as little damage to the object you're looking at? Uh, and that can be, for instance, x-rays in humans. Uh, x-rays are great for making computer tomography images, but they can also cause cancer. So you want to keep the number of x-ray photons as low as possible. So. The idea then is to squeeze out as much information as possible by doing actual photon counting. Okay, now if you look at single photons, you've got a bunch of information available from them. Uh, direction, energy, the timing, uh, sometimes uh, you can release photons, I'll show you how in a specific way, a specific time, uh, and then you have uh, transverse polarization, circular polarization, then you get also the possibility of using entanglement with quantum mechanics phenomenon. Okay? Now, uh, in quantum mechanics, you're limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but uh, when you're doing X-ray imaging of humans, the wavelength of X-rays is so much smaller than the detectors that are used that uh, that's not a, an important consideration. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, uh, as an example, let's consider positron imaging. In positron imaging, you, uh, you create a compound which goes into the body and concentrates in particular organs or tumors, uh, which contains nuclei such as fluorine 18, which are radioactive and emit positrons. And then uh, the positron comes out of the fluorine nucleus, 
uh, and uh, it wanders around a little bit until it loses enough energy so that it can interact with an electron, and the positron and the electron are antimatter pair. They annihilate, and, and two gamma rays come off in opposite directions. So uh, you can reduce the problem of positron tomography uh, if you have a detector that can pick up your gamma rays on both sides, then you get a line, and your, your uh, estimation procedure is to find estimate where the positron and electron annihilate it's along that line, uh, which is defined by the detectors that catch the two gamma rays. Okay? So that's, so I'm calling it a kind of quantum imaging, because you're, you're trying to image from one, in this case, let's call it a Incidents of that or the sun takes the right two gamma rays and two detectors on opposite sides. Okay, okay so I, I made up an algorithm for doing this uh, back in 75. And uh, here, what I did is uh, I used a simple uh, image, which is the, the letter A. And in the letter A, I had a concentration of randomly. Radio radioactive uh, emitters in these boxes, okay, which are seven times the background. So uh, it's uh, the contrast, in other words, is seven to one on the average. And each E here is a single uh, uh, annihilation event which, which occurred, okay? Okay, oh, excuse me, no, it's not quite. Okay, okay, no, let me go to the right side. The right side, you see, I did 1,000 events. So there are 1,000 lines here, and if you stand back from them, you can vaguely see the letter A from the overlap of these lines. The problem is to estimate the location for the event on each one, and the E's are the estimates of the location. So you can see that I did get some plausible concentration of the events along uh, the boxes where the, uh, most of the emission was occurring. And this is only 1,000 photons, okay? Uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, the images that you guys are dealing with, I'm sure you'll find many orders of magnitude more photons involved. So this is an image reconstructed from only 1,000 photons, okay? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go over the algorithm here. It went, went through various algorithms, and this is far from optimized yet. Uh, okay, uh, so because uh, time's limited, I want to go through a couple of things here. Okay, now in terms of uh, X-rays, let's see. Okay, let's see. Well, skip over here. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the game Battleship? Yeah, yeah, we just played it this weekend. For you just played it this weekend. weekend. Okay, yes. okay. You guys in India know what Battleship is? It's like Ujwal, Jesse, Esmet. They all said yes. They all said yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so let me. Oops. Hold on a second. I'm gonna get back to my slides here. Okay. Okay, so in Battleship, what you're doing is you're getting binary information. Yes, no, you hit somebody's ship, and you're trying to build up an image of where their ships are. Okay? So uh, uh, it's uh, quantum imaging is, in a way, a game of Battleship. You're getting uh, generally one photon at a time, and you do with it and try to build up a picture. Now, one possibility is to use what's called turnstile photons. And these are kind of neat because uh, in, with the turnstile photons, you can actually uh, give change of voltage and one photon comes out. So you know that a photon is on its way. In ordinary X-ray photons, in any X-ray, standard X-ray tube, uh, the, uh, the X-ray photons come out randomly uh, with Poisson statistics. So you don't know if a particular photon is on its way or not. So it turns out photons uh, have a, a, a possibility of reducing the statistics because they're, two, they're basically two, they're two Poisson processes going on. For X-ray photons, you have the emission, 
from the standard x-ray tube, which is Poisson. And then the x-ray photons either get scattered or absorbed inside uh, whatever you're looking at, the person or whatever. And that's another Poisson process. So if you could use turnstile photons, you could get away from a con having a convolution of two Poisson processes and therefore sh should be able to significantly reduce the dose. Okay? So we had a paper on the possibility of doing that with, uh, with the simulation that shows that it does help. Okay? Uh, entangled photons are kind of neat. Uh, entangled photons, uh, you have a pair of photons that go off in different directions. And uh, uh, if you capture one, you kind of know what the other one's doing. And that, that's, uh, this is this weird phenomenon in quantum mechanics called entanglement. And entangled photons can be of different energies. Now, this is for the future, because nobody's ever built anything with entangled photons. And for extra, no one's done, uh, for that matter, has done uh, uh, turnstile photons either in x-rays. They've only been done in visible light. So these are things for the future. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me skip ahead here. Okay, now. Uh, okay, so I want to go up ahead here uh, to uh, get to more quantum stuff here. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, this uh, this may be related, but. Uh, I just want to show you this. This is a fun idea which has not been developed. Uh, uh, the French Impressionists uh, developed a technique in the 1800s where they painted by using dots. And uh, if, you, if you take this image and you reduce it, you can see it, it becomes more and more clear what you're looking at. Uh, and this is what's called pointillism. Now, the, uh, the thing about pointillism, which was kind of curious, is the position, shape, orientation, and size of dots is not very important, just the average brightness and color. And uh, so this is, pointillism uh, could produce a, another way of uh, dealing with images uh, and reducing the information that needed it. Okay, now, uh, I got into eye tracking, which... Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you guys do it too. Uh, here's the here's the scene in the picture, and here is the tracking of somebody's eye and looking at the scene. And you can see that their eyes are mostly focusing on faces and uh, not uh, and look, looking around. And uh, that's obviously related to the foveal uh, imaging. Okay. So uh, with a film named Graham Alberry, we tried to develop a computer tomography algorithm which works the same way. The idea was that we'll take a single point in a picture and run a bunch of x-rays across the picture, okay? And uh, what CT brush will do is do a computer tomography algorithm in that little region that you're looking at. And, uh, but the rays that are used depend on where you look. So you can move this brush around, and as you move it around, you can sharpen up the image and do and get your computer tomography image this way. Now, the advantage of this is that you are intelligently guiding where the x-rays go, and uh, uh, we suspect that this would lead to a tremendous reduction in the amount of x-ray photons compared to just blasting the patient with uh, x-rays from all directions, which is the normal procedure, okay? Uh, and uh, here's the track. Uh, we kept track of where the person moved the point. So this is, a, this is kind of, this is the eye tracking of uh, following the use of the brush uh, by the person playing this game, okay? And you can see indeed that uh, it, it's similar to the uh, uh, eye tracking when you're looking at a picture. And the person rapidly picked up the uh, objects and uh, uh, focused on them, which then led to a decent reconstruction. 
Okay. Now let's see. Let me get get past a few other things here. Okay. Now, why do we want to do this? Because uh, you guys are talking. I asked why. Why you want to do image compression? Uh, here's the major reason you want to do it. Uh, about 15% of the population exposure uh, to uh, ionizing radiations comes from medicine. Uh, in, uh, I've got some systems from Germany, uh, and in Germany, uh, computer tomography was 5% of the radiological exam examinations, but computer tomography takes a lot of x-ray dose. So it was already up to 40% of the total x-ray dose to the population in Germany. Uh, that would be that would have been uh, uh, in 2015, just five years ago. Oh no, excuse me, 1999. Uh, no, that was in 1999. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's the U.S. figures. Uh, the computer tomography was contributing 75 percent of the X-ray dose to the population by the year 2002. Okay. So the average CT study delivers about 16 times the dose of an average non-CT standard projection x-ray film that you might be used to. Okay, so this is one reason we've got to get the dose down. And there are lots of papers, especially in children, uh, this dose can uh, have long-term uh, consequences. Uh, okay, now let's see. Oh, I think that's it. Okay, that's, that's what I had to say. A lot of other technical stuff I've skipped over. But uh, the idea then is that if we can combine either human or machine intelligence to guide the uh, x-rays during uh, x-ray imaging, we can get the dose down probably quite a bit. I, I, maybe by one or two orders of magnitude. And uh, this, this is a, uh, a, a question that's open to, uh, uh, to testing, simulation, etc. So we had this, uh, this paper, CT brushing cancer that video games for computer tomography dose immunization. Now, cancer zap, uh, you've got the paper there. Uh, in cancer zap, the idea is to not just have x-rays going across the way we did it in CT brush, but actually have single photons go across. So it would be like a shooting game. Uh, let's see. I, uh, we have that paper. Anyway, you've got, you've got the paper there. You can see we, we, uh, we can see what it is sort of shooting, shooting photons into a region which you can't see. But as you shoot them, you build up the image. And the question is, can you then uh, uh, image tumors, say so you're looking for tumors, can you image them with uh, the, how do you image them with the smallest number of photons? Okay. Okay, so that's what I got to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, press the two-hour lecture in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's an uh, interesting set of questions. Uh, we're going to move on, but I want people to think about that. If people have any ideas about how we can apply, say, like a formal machine learning technique to it, uh, you know, you can contact me or Dick, and we can talk about it some more. Uh, we'll probably revisit this next week, so. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to do. I wanted to get into this paper with the Peters rule. So this is the paper that Jesse sent me. Uh, if you're, um, if you have to go before we finish this, this is okay. Um, I'm going to present my screen now. So, Dick, if you could. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to quit here. <laughs> If you go down to the lower right, it'll say. I haven't I haven't found the window to, to quit well, from. That's the problem. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's still up. Okay. So we're getting into the new test here. Yeah, okay, I can just take over, actually. There we go. 
So, can you see my screen here? This is the deep fovea paper. Uh, now we're going to switch to the Peters roll paper, and this is it right here. So this is uh, this is uh, weighing the evidence in Peters roll. Does neuronal morphology predict connectivity? And again, I thank Jesse for uh, bringing this to our attention. Um, and we can again talk about this more offline, but uh, why don't we go through this a little bit and discuss what this is. So this is an interesting paper because they talk about network connectivity. And it's it seems at first to be a little sort of, you know, off to the side of what we've been talking about with machine learning and, and deep learning. and But actually, it does have something to do with it because we're talking about um, the sort of the structure of networks. And in this paper, they talk about connectomes, which are um, maps of neurons and their connectivity in nervous systems. So they actually uh, talk a lot about this in this paper, they kind of revisit it critically. Uh, they talk about different criterion you can use to determine connectivity, and they test this in the hippocampus of rats or mice or some model organism. Um, they talk about this thing called Peter's rule. So Peter's rule is, um, how did they define it? Um, I guess it, it has to do with the way in which neurons are connected. So um, in this case, they're talking about researchers employing axon dendrite co-locations. So what they do is they take images of the brain and they look for like axon dendrite co-locations. They, they try to define them and then they count the number of those and they can count the number of connections between cells. Uh, if you look at like C. elegans connectome, there are actually a couple of ways that they measure those connectomes, and those are uh, they actually look at gap junctions and other connection, you know, criteria. But basically, if you're looking at connections, you're looking at you're using some criterion. And Peter's rule is this axon dendrite co-location rule. Now, they talk about how this is mapped to real data, and we'll get to that in a minute. So, um. Let's see. So there's a paper that, uh, a book that, uh, so I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Valentino Breitenberg. So Valentino Breitenberg wrote a book called uh, Breitenberg Vehicles. And in my other group, we've been working on that for a while on how to use Breitenberg Vehicles to look at developmental uh, connectomes and developmental neurobiology. But he also wrote another book with shoes and it's called Cortex, uh, Statistics and Geometry of Neural Connectivity. And this book, it's, it's not as common as the Breitenberg Vehicles book, but he actually goes and he has uh, takes pictures of real cortical slices, and he uh, they, they talk about it, you know, they, they do some real neuroscience on it. So um, it, it's a very rare book, but I think it might be on Google Books if you want to check that out. In any case, they've... Uh, you know they've talked a little bit about that uh, book in this in this uh, paper. So if you see that reference, that's what that's referring to. Um, another thing that they've noticed when they look at nervous systems, and I actually have talked about this with one of my other collaborators, is that although there are a lot of neurons and a lot of synapses in the brain, uh, connectivity is somewhat sparse, and we don't really know why that is. But if you use a number of criterion the uh, connectivity is a lot sparser than expected. And so, uh, again, you have these natural rules that you can observe, and we're wondering if, you know, maybe we can apply them to machine learning uh, technologies and what their consequences are for, like, deep learning and things like that, where we say that we're uh, simulating the brain, but, you know, we don't really know exactly what we're, uh, what we're doing. We don't have a, a pure or a... Uh, basic research of uh, deep learning networks. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Uh, this is just a good paper. I was reading through it. Um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to find some more interesting parts of it. Um, there's a... They, I think they talk about levels, and I can't remember where it is in here. But they talk about levels of... Uh, level two, assessing potential 
potential connectivity amongst individual neurons. So this part here is where they uh, talk about Peter's rule and using it to assess connections among individual neurons. And they actually, in this case, use a real uh, set of cortical connections to discuss this. And they discuss the different areas that you can use this in. Uh, different. This, these are like in like uh, analyzing real brains, but they give a set of rules for connectivity in here. That again, you're just observing the brain; you're not observing the behavior. Um, but they do have some interesting things to say about that. And estimating synapse numbers with neuronal pairs. So, you know, anytime we create a connectome or create a set of connections, we're estimating the connections and their values. So it's not like we're uh, able to do an exact analysis. And so assumptions matter in that case. And so they talk about that. And then they use data to sort of uh, analyze, you know, to, to analyze real data sets to apply their theoretical model. And they turn out that Peter's, it turns out that Peter's rule is pretty accurate, meaning about 80%, it predicts about 80% of the connections in these databases. And then the rest of that, the sort of the balance of that error is in specific connections that they hadn't thought about before. So, they think of, you know, you think about generic connections that you might be able to predict. They predict 80% of those. And then there, but there are also specific types of connections like interneurons and axo-axonic cells, which then make up the balance of that error. If you set new rule or if you uh, redefine the rule to account for those cells, they're actually almost perfect in their predictions. So this is an interesting paper. Um, it, I think it has a, it has a lot of potential to inform some of this stuff in deep learning and in like connectionist, um, you know, thinking connectionist network design. So I encourage you to look over this paper and give some comments on it offline or maybe next week. Um, I wanted to ask Jesse if he had any comments on the paper at all. Okay, let me see. Uh, he, I think he put them in the chat. So our chat window is, not, where is it? Here it is. Uh, chat window. So he said, I had a little discussion with my friend, actually Logan, who you know from Envision Twitter stuff. And he said, it's interesting, but we thought the aerospace might be important for actually understanding connectomes and how things develop. Uh, I may be able to say more about the paper afterward, but I don't have a lot more to add right now. I'm curious about Breitenberg's connection. Yeah, so Breitenberg was, of course, a neurobiologist by training, and he and he did the uh, books on he did the book on Breitenberg vehicles, which was actually kind of a thought experiment into what a nervous system should look like. But he actually did a lot of neurobiology, and his interest was in cortex as well as sort of these uh, fa nervous systems. And so he's actually done he's done a number of pieces of work on cortex. There might be some papers too on that area. Uh, and in a couple of weeks, I'm going to give a talk on hierarchical temporal modeling, which is actually using cortex to, like, you know, using the six layers of cortex to as an analytical tool for, you know, some sort of machine learning application. So we'll talk more about that maybe then, too. Uh, so otherwise, I think that's a interesting paper. Thanks for bringing it up, Jesse. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about it more offline. So... We're at the top of the hour. Uh, we went a little over, but that's okay. Um, and if Ojwal and Dick could send me copies of their slides, I could distribute it to everyone else if that's okay, if everyone's comfortable with that. Um, and then next week, um, Ojwal said, let me stop sharing here. Ojwal said, sure, okay, that's good. And so we are... We're at the end of our time. I think we got a lot into the meeting. Uh, I was glad you could find it. I look forward to presenting things again. Okay. Uh, so if we have any other questions, we can handle them offline. Otherwise, next week, uh, Ujwal might want to present on more on the deep fovea stuff or something else. And then um, we can, um, and then I'll present on something I haven't decided yet. I think it's, uh, I can't remember what I'm going to call it. 
So I'll send out, send it out in the email next week. Okay, well, thanks for meeting. Talk to you guys next week. Have a good week. Thanks.